Uh, okay, and here we go. Top of the hour. Let's get started. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me okay. If you can't, type message in. Um, I'm Tom Doherty with uh, Triple Point. A little bit of housekeeping up front. This will be recorded. That will be available on our YouTube channel um, after the presentation. Um, go to webinar automatically creates a participant certification that will receive in about 24 hours. If you need something more in depth than that, you can reply to um, the organizer and we will prepare a certificate at specific times on it if need be. Um, as we unfold here, all I have at the table is uh, bring to the table is just my experiences and my time in the field. And interestingly, uh, for the last about six years now, I've been involved in the wastewater just on the lagoon side. So I travel lagoon systems all over the place and I see all kinds of problems and solutions and operator innovation and ingenuity. And if I could sit down with uh, you know any of you guys on this conference call, I'd probably learn something else, but I'm just gonna try to convey my experiences today uh, as we unfold here. So let's uh, let's get to it. We're about a minute off the hour. There'll be a, a opportunity for uh, questions, specific problems you might see, or design type questions uh, with regard to lagoon uh, treatment. Uh, towards the end, we'll kind of block a little bit of time, and I can I'll read the question out loud uh, for everybody, and then uh, have my shot at answering it. So just a little bit of open up top about uh, triple point is an end to end. To end lagoon solution provider from aeration to ammonia removal, uh, nitrification, denitrification, and tertiary policy, polishing for solids and phosphorus, and some other things in between, but that's the meat and potatoes of it right there. So what we're gonna look at today with regard to lagoon rehab is problems, more problems, uh, the emerging, not even emerging particularly, but just an in-depth look at the importance of aeration bubble size and what it can do specifically in a lagoon environment, solutions and case studies and some Q&A. So right off the bat, this is a huge problem. This is uh, in Washington state. This is a secondary lagoon after a primary aerated lagoon, and they've got a little bit of aeration here, surface aerators. And can you imagine uh, one of your clients uh, or if you're an operator walking out to work uh, Monday morning and you've got this, a floating liner, and it's actually in three positions, the foreground and, and rear right and rear left. This site actually has an NPDES permit as well, so they've got, uh, uh, limits to meet, but they've turned off the surface aerators here because the propellers are going down at an angle. They're scared another bubble might come up and rip it open. And so this was in this state of affairs for you know, the better side of a year, actually. And uh, I don't have a, my last touch point was about four months ago. And what they had thought had occurred is this was built in the 70s, early 70s, over an old swamp. And it began to generate natural gases and lifted that up. But that's a problem. I mean, I don't know if that's methane underneath there or just CO2 or or what it is. So the the latest read I had on is they were going to try to brute force those back down with heavy weights. And I, I don't have a conclusion on that. Maybe I will down the road sometime, but that's a big problem. So I'll, I'll sprinkle this thing with truisms and operator hints, but here's a fundamental uh, of every wastewater treatment plant in America, remove BOD. That's really at the, at the, at the highest level what you're trying to do, that, that's, that's the truth. So um, Oshin demand, a lot of times we say BOD and COD out there, but I like to emphasize that the second half of the, second two thirds of the acronym is OD for oxygen demand. Um, biochemical oxygen demand, measure of oxygen requirements by bacteria to decompose. COD, chemical oxygen demand, um, you can read the rest of it. And there's multiple uh, forms of, we see CBOD, uh, carbonaceous, nitrogenous, insoluble. And there's even a few others. Um, 
SBCOD, PBOD, but that's getting in the weeds. Fundamentally, uh, uh, carbonaceous and, and nitrogenous together make BOD5. Oftentimes we'll have a five behind because it takes five days to gestate it to, to do the lab sampling. And coincidentally, a lot of uh, plants will pull BOD samples on Thursday or Friday so they can count, get them into the lab and count the weekend as a couple of the days so they can have data the following Tuesday, Wednesday, if, if you're doing it on site at, at your own lab. And it's just interesting that operationally we're kind of forced into utilizing that for five days. There's some movement out there to possibly allow the surrogate instrumentation to approximate um, the BOD and have that be reportable, but so far regulatory likes uh, BOD5. And then the final point there, sludge layer releases nutrients as another oxygen demand as we'll get a little deeper into in some case studies. So lagoons, um, very high level. There's, it, they're about a third of the NPDES permits in the country. Depending on what EPA literature you look at, uh, there's about 18 to 20,000 permits and about uh, 7,000 of those are lagoons. So been around forever, um, literally, almost uh, very simple, almost Roman times. Let's put stuff in one pond, put it in another pond, and pretty soon it settles out and it's getting quite a bit better. And we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated over the years on the treatment methodologies. So um, in the 60s and the 70s, when a lot of lagoons were constructed uh, in the States, the aeration du jour, if they were not facultative, was a surface aerator. And over the years, there's just much more efficient ways to get air in the water. Um, the surface aerators will do reasonable uh, damage if you are in the five foot, six foot depth range because they reach the bottom easier. And we'll look at an, a chart here in a little while that, that examines that. But anytime that you're throwing white water up in the air, it's just not the most efficient use of energy of the, of the power bill you're writing every month to the utility company. You're kicking A and taking names in the top foot 18 inches for DO and, and uh, mixing, but there's just more efficient ways to go about it. Um, some of the challenges of uh, surface aerators icing up. There's some that have torqued over um, <clears throat> because of ice and get upside down in the, in the lagoon and then the operator's got to go out and fix it. So as an operator myself as well, I like to just throw in these little uh, incidental uh, various no particular order hints and tips. And item one here will really um, permeate throughout the presentation because that, it's a big part of what a lot of the lagoon rehabilitation is wrapped around is, is short circuiting or sludge accumulation, sludge accumulation. Lagoon turnover is, um, you know, people say the spring turnover, but that's because ambient air is persuading the water temperature and the water temperature is changing. It's turning over that slug, sludge blanket on the bottom, releasing some stuff so you get your fresh odors. Usually you, you can smell it. Um, too much sludge will just push treatment downstream. I've got one uh, site that was out in Colorado here. It's been last year now that he is getting about 30% reduction in his primary cell. And is, from a modeling perspective, we always like to look at 70 80% BOD, BOD reduction, that is, in that first cell. But his solids has built up so much, it's just pushing treatment downstream. Um, and adding subsurface aeration can help defeat solids build up. And we'll look at that one more in depth. Um, got a couple other sites that have very high DO in polishing ponds, which are quiescent, just polishing ponds, no air. And in certain times of the day, they get these eights and nines DOs. And so uh, in Bishop California is an example, and in Mission Hills, California, another one. They use a trash pump and they grab that high DO water and they send it back to the front, the influent primary area lagoon, where they're going to hold them like half a part. And so I, I call these like poor man's tricks, but they're, they're quite crafty to try to use your available DO to um, improve plant performance. So the solids build up on the uh, 
in the lagoon is it's kind of the proverbial frog in the pot on the stove because in a lot of instances this takes years it isn't just happened a year or six months it can take 10 and 15 and 20 years and so the plant doesn't operate as it used to uh, because you've lost um, volume therefore hrt um, and so it just uh, happens over time um, Another truism is DO of two milligrams per liter is an optimum design target. That's the default uh, in, in our company. And here's a key thing I want to spend a couple minutes on is we advocate the DO is measured half lagoon depth. If you've got a 10 foot lagoon, we think you should look at the DO at five feet or quite a ways down uh, at a minimum to give a fair representation. And a good case study example of where this has been kind of a false uh, sense of security, I don't even call it a sense of security, but the, this picture on the right is uh, a facility that uh, happens to be a sugar beet processor and their complaint was odor controls. And I'm talking to the 17 year environmental person. I said, well, what's what the deal you hold in that? She goes, we're getting fives and sixes. And I said, well, where, and it didn't make sense to me with the amount of odor. I said, can you tell me how you sample that? And he basically pulled off the top one foot. And so that's an 11 foot pond. I would expect with the massive amount of these have many 50 horsepower surface aerators, and there was quite a few of them in this pond, like 11 of them, uh, that you have very high DO on the top. But that that is not an indication of the health of that water body. You need to get down a ways and get that DO uh, sample more realistically. Um, to determine what's going on with the pond. So you can't have five and six DO and have massive odor problems and, and uh, bad water quality. They were irrigating here and they also determined over time that the irrigation, the water was so dirty, it was drying on the leaves of the crop and therefore inhibiting photosynthesis. So now they have gone to a blend when they're at the end of the irrigation cycle, they, they pick up some groundwater so they're putting clean water out there so they can keep the leaves clean. So at least the crop, the, the water they're putting out there, the crop will come up with some normalcy and not be inhibited. Kind of an interesting sidebar problem. Here's an example of uh, engineer in Montana that, uh, this is just some of these operator engineer ingenuity type slides. He built um, this little floating raft. Inside that raft is a plastic container inside the container is Hawk DR 900 or whatever the model number was and he wanted the the DO three feet down and so he would dangle the cord uh, to the probe underneath this and get out on the corner of the lagoon that's long rope in the background and he'd walk one way and one guy would walk the other way and then we'd go out and he'd put it in the section of the lagoon he wanted at uh, the depth that he wanted he'd tie it off and he had about three days of battery and so it would record uh, every hour, I think it was, and then he would retrieve the raft and pull it back in, and he had his own little portable SCADA system so he could see a DO curve, and I just thought it was pretty cool. Ingenuity. Here's another guy in California that he doesn't cast with this fishing pole, but he uses the reach out a little farther, not pull that proverbial sample right in next to the bank that's easy, uh, or if you're out in a boat, so he can set the buoy there that's in his hand, and at the depth he wants. So the bottom of his sample here would be approximately um, getting close to two feet uh, down in, in his particular lagoon. So this is real important with regards to uh, the solids build up and understand what's going on with a, a potential failing lagoon is HRT, hydraulic residence time, is a function of volume. Obviously, volume or loss of it impacts treatment kinetics. So if you start taking one, two, three foot of sludge on the bottom, you cut the volume down significantly. Um, so an example here would be if you had 0.25 MGD average daily flow in cell one and 1.5 million gallon volume in that cell, and in cell two is 1.5, and cell three is two million gallon volume, a kind of a typical setup, you would have six plus six plus eight days, you have 20 days total HRT there. And this, this is just very typical for small town America, but what's really the HRT today? And that's, that's at a full empty cell. Is it 11 days? Is it eight days? Is it five days? 
uh, that's that's one of the things that leads to the biggest problem that we see out there is, is, is lack of HRT, therefore volume. So to dig into a little bit of, of kind of more background and one-on-one -on -one treatment here, I think most folks, there's a lot of engineers on this call are familiar with some of this, but I'm gonna go over it nonetheless just to show our understanding of it. So in a facultative lagoon, you have no particular artificial air. You have plenty of wind and surface and humidity that's creating DO in that upper uh, layer. And then you've got more anaerobic activity on the bottom. <clears throat> In a partial mixed lagoon, we are designing two to five standard cubic feet per minute for a thousand cubic feet of, of volume of water in there. And that standard reaction rate, well understood, is, is 0.28. Vigorous mix is not well understood out there. I get a lot of question marks about that. Um, it was introduced to us by an engineering firm in the Midwest. It's defined as you see, seven to eight. SCFM per thousand cubic feet of volume, and it's attached to reaction rate of 0 0.85. And then when you go up to complete mix, everything's in suspension now. And I, I even and currently, as I speak, I'm dealing with a client that says, "I want this. I want cell one complete mix." And it's a massive cell with a big flow rate, and it is a huge, huge amount of error to make that complete mix. We calculated we're not sure they need that complete mix, or we're suggesting what if we baffle the first third of it and we complete mix that and go with a different metric in the second because complete mix is horsepower, is aeration, and we only see complete mix when we have an area that's growing and they still have a lagoon system and suddenly you've got more hookups and you got more throughput. If you want to accelerate things, then we will go to a complete mix in an earlier cell or uh, baffle off part of it so your capex is not so high. Um, and as long as we can get to the, the final effluent quality. And then you can go to another level of, of introducing RAS and a clarifier, and you can have a lagoon return activated sludge, and that just takes even more air yet. But you can't accelerate uh, treatment. I mean, that's the difference between a lagoon in Podunk, Montana, that's got 20 to 40 days HRT, and an oxidation ditch in, in central town USA that needs to have HRT of 8 to 12 hours uh, they're trying or eight to 24 hours uh, generally they're trying to turn it really fast small footprint we need treatment connects to really go so algae and duckweed common problems um algae respire overnight release do so some algae is good duckweed can block sun and inhibit algae growth so the mere uh, existence of duckweed is not a problem per se unless you have a solids issue and then we have to look at um getting rid of duckweed and, and the, the best way for duckweed to get rid of it it's still physical it's physically getting it out and getting up on the bank but unless you can block the sun the best management practices are to mitigate up front our approach is to try to, try to take out as much as possible shops is maybe you remember from uh, early biology or science classes carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen phosphorus and sulfur those are the key building blocks all organisms need. Uh, even the BOD work on the microbes, they pull in a little bit of carbon, a little bit of hydrogen, nitrogen, you need phosphorus along the process. So our, it's, it's, always a, it's about mitigation. Uh, unless you can absolutely block the sun out, uh, you're gonna have some level of algae, which is healthy and okay. It's just the filamentous or certainly not the blue-green, the, the blow-ups of that. But as much as you can take out up front, the more we can remove, remove BOD up front, the more we're removing up, uh, using up carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and the better are we are downstream to not be in a situation where we've got filamentous for sure. That's, so it's a mitigate, you know, not litigate, as they say, best management practice. This is just another, uh, how can we do it better out there? It isn't anything that we provide, but it's just good, good paying attention to the layout of the lagoon and just drawing courtesy of Steve Harris. So the influent comes in where the X is right here. And inherently over time, what can happen, it can just turn right and go right out the effluent to the next pond. You lose access to all the HRT that you get here when things short circuit, you can get the buildup on the sides of the heavier solids that fall right out when it comes in. And just goes right out. So his 
suggestions. Why don't we build a header up front and just reroute the inflow over here and let's split it up and slow down that velocity. So here's an example of a site that did that. They used to come in in the corner over here and what they found over time, this is a really long lagoon, like 700 feet long by 220 feet wide. And it, it built up walls on either side of this diagonal entry, and it would go farther and farther and farther down the lagoon. So this is a goonite line pond, and they had to do some plumbing back behind where the folks were standing. You can see the fresher uh, concrete right here, ABS pipe. They just, it was just a very simple, um, relatively inexpensive. They had some trenching and some rerouting back under the ground, but as far as putting this out on the top and cabling it off, that was a, that's pretty straightforward. So he's got a lot better performance. This happens to be in Bishop, California. A lot better performance out of this lagoon when he'd come out of the corner and he split it four ways and loading it right down the middle. It just naturally splits and gives him some flow down here, slows the velocity down, loads his aerators up. Um, but he actually has surface aerators there. He's bought some fine bubble aerators to go between the surface aerators uh, in order to, to chew up the solids. Just another view of the same shot. Here's one that this happens to be in Idaho. And this is interesting to me because this is a 2 million gallon a day flow. And the, the, the pond was just completely redone. You see the huge air header in the background and the floating laterals going out to subsurface diffused aeration. But this was not looked at very strongly. When them uh, pumps kick on and um, lift station pumps kick on this can get very significant you see the current backing up right here what they did is they took an old surface aerator and cabled it off to try to break that up a little bit while they're continuing to look at maybe going to some sort of a manifold system to evenly load that pond that's a, a really good trick i think to split that up in front well, i'm going to make a couple notes about an aerator that we use in the subsequent solids removal uh rehabilitation studies here. So just quickly, this particular aerator has a coarse bubble um, inside of it and fine bubble here. And when we say coarse bubble, we're talking literally four to six inch diameter bubbles. When we're talking fine bubble, we're talking one eighth inch to one quarter. So you really get your good oxygen transfer with your fine bubbles. You get the very good mixing with the coarse bubble. Looking down on top, it's just a simple coarse bubble diffuser. And this static chamber is intentionally open because we get some suction coming up from the bottom here, mixing solids up. There's several of these units sitting alongside the shore, getting ready to go in the field. Um, here is a project in Montana that started up uh, earlier this year. This is a Greenfield RV park. Um, and so they wanted to go with uh, Goons, and you don't very often see. We do dry installs every once in a while, but most of the time it's wet. You're out on a boat and you're dropping them in from the top. But here you can see this uh, flexible weighted air hose going up to uh, the P blower on land. Um, and then here's a, a, a cartoon version of it showing a little bit better what's going on there. And this is just like the location of Montana. We're just showing you a PD blower on land, header over to manifolds that feed these individual airlines out the manifolds have ball valves that control these individual uh, aerators. This one's shut off, it can be installed on your plumbing up for maintenance. And just an engineering drawing of roughly what that looks like. The flexible weighted tubing is pretty cool. It brings a lot to the party in a retrofit or a rehab situation because you could have undulations on the bank or other pipes laying around. You could have an old truck tire and rim sitting on the bottom and we'll just go over it and bend, but eventually lay in position, uh, it's flexible and weighted. And you wanna work on this stuff in the middle of the day, I can tell you, because in the mornings when you're out on jobs, it's, just, it's uh, hard to straighten out, but we usually take a piece of equipment and, and, and drag it out or two or three guys, and it lays out quite straight as you're getting queued up to do an installation. And this slide has nothing to do with nothing, but just see if anybody fell asleep uh, by now, this is some, actually some Australian researchers trying to capture methane. And uh, like I said, it has nothing to do with nothing, but that was a cool slide. <laughs> so uh, even EPA says aeration is to require oxygen to the bugs, 
provide mixing so the microorganisms come in contact with all the suspended organic matter. So twofold uh, purpose there. This slide is really interesting. It's just a generic um, chart, but we start getting into the, the efficiency if you're looking at a rehab of, from an aeration perspective. It's all about pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. So if you look at a typical mechanical surface aerator, you're getting two and a half to three and a half pounds of oxygen horsepower per hour. When you go up to fine bubble diffusers, you're getting about six to six and a half um, pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour. That just comes down to the check you write to the utility company. And I, we see that time and again, it's almost a two to one, or sometimes it's a 60% of, of before. At one location, it was doing 60 horsepower, using 60 horsepower surface. They had 80, but there's always several broke down. At 60, we did the calcs, we come back at 30 horsepower. So that's a permanent savings to the grid. If they're writing a $7,000 check to the power company, then they're more, more like a $3,500 check to a power company, or whatever the numbers are. Um, but that, that can help towards amortization of the capex. This slide looks at the same thing of, of pounds of oxygen per horsepower per hour, but if we look at depth of the lagoon on the x-axis, you will see that the surface aerators do quite a bit better at the shallower water, pretty much because they've reached the bottom. The challenge is that then you need to potentially use more to not have short circuits between your pockets of area that you're reaching the bottom. That just has to be um, calculated, which you can see when you use a coarse and fine bubble aeration, so as anywhere from eight to 16 feet, you're getting this um, higher transfer of oxygen. So this slide is just to talk about some reaction kinetics, reaction time. So O2 is a well-known odor mitigant, okay? It will disrupt hydrogen sulfide. It'll reduce it to HS minus and other inert sulfur compounds. It's, it's well-known as an odor mitigant, uh, just like iron chemistry is or biological uh, biofilters. Um, it'll balance pH levels. And importantly here, O2 can transform metals such as iron and manganese to their oxidized state. Now we're not particularly looking at manganese nor iron for that matter. What is a phenomena of the surface of the fine bubble that's a reaction time that's on the order of six to 24 hours. So what we're talking about here is an oxidation, literally uh, not a biological process where the bugs got us, the bugs aren't eating on iron and manganese. This is something that's occurring as an oxidative, uh, almost like an advanced oxidation process. You touch ozone to something, it disrupts it. And this is very important to understand when we look at bubble size and, and reducing solids. So looking at bubble size, on the left, that's a 12 inch diameter basketball. Basketball is nine inches of diameter. So this is a great big basketball. It's a great big bubble, a 12 inch bubble. Its surface area computes to 4.8 square feet. If we take that bubble into six inch bubble, now we're looking at 185 square feet of surface area when released off the bottom of a floor can do its damage. And then if you exponentiate the argument and you go to a much smaller to a fine bubble, it does, you get massive amount of square feet with the same cubic foot of, of uh, bubble. So that's where you get, this is where H2S gets disrupted. This is where iron and manganese begins to settle out and other available contaminants so moving on to uh, how do you handle sludge with, with uh, aeration? If we look at the microbial buildup of sludge on the bottom, it's mostly carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Some of these others. Studies show again, again, this is a VSS or volatile suspended solids test. If you pull a sample out of the bottom, take it to a lab and say, give me a volatile and non-volatile, most of the time on average, it's gonna come back 85% of that dead bacteria an algae mass can be converted to gas. So that's where um, we've been able to show some dramatic solids reduction by dropping this area in right down into that duff layer and physically stir the sludge up, use the aerobic biomass to consume those volatile solids and get oxygen up into the sludge. Pick that sludge up and get it up into the treatment layer. Uh, here's an example of one in Caldwell, Idaho, where this was done. This was built as an evaporative lagoon. 
and it immediately had problems. This is just started in 17. This is the Greenfield project in 2017. Trip point didn't have anything to do with this. But they built a lagoon and there wasn't accounting for the 5,000 milligram per liter of BOD going into it. It was a small little operation, five to 8,000 gallons per day. They immediately were bringing in chemical because the operation has uh, outdoor weddings, the concert venues, the retail, and the odor comes up there. It's just, it's a total turnoff and it's not the business they're in. They're in the warm and fuzzy business, <laughs> not the cold and prickly stinky business. So they contacted us about what do we do with this? This is like a year later. And so we said, look, if you get, their water volume was very shallow or water level. They said, you can get it up to about two and a half feet and we can do something for you. And so you can see the startup here was on May 1st, 18. We're trying to inject oxygen. Again, this is evaporative. There's no throughput either. So there's four rows of, of three here. And these are fine bubble only. When we go under six feet, we'll just go straight to a fine bubble only um, setup. But the key point I'm making here goes to the next day, the next slide. This is on 5-2, the next day later. The, look at the foam here. What has happened is we set down that fine bubble in that, in their instance, they had 13 inches of duff. I should have showed my slide judge picture before this one, but it comes up next. And we are really foaming the heck out of that. We just immediately are hitting all that stuff in there that had no oxygen. It was fermenting, the oxygen demand, OD, again, was pulling all the oxygen out of the water, fermenting, and, and going stale odor. I mean, it's an odor, total odor complaint. In fact, there was only 26 inches of water in there when we started this thing up, and he had to raise water to get it up to there. Otherwise, he said, I said, I don't have anything for you. Um, and it's pretty dirty water above that, too. It's not even normal decant water. So here's your dirty solids, and we set right down in that. And so that, that uh, fine bubble really went to work quick on that stuff. In the same vein, here's a very large one. It's a big sugar bee operation in the Midwest. And this pond used to be either an area of lagoon with surface aerators, and it had got past its prime. They were, they got to the point where regulatory had given them warnings and then eventually find them. And then they're bringing in truckloads of peroxide to shove into this to forego the fines. And finally, they says, well, we're going to do the subsurface aeration. So big header, they wanted the fixed laterals on the bottom, a bunch of aerators getting ready to be put in here. But again, the purpose of this is to set up this slide. This is a picture after everything's installed and the foam again, you see here, what the, the foam is off-gassing or manifesting. We're turning this, in this instance, COD. This particular site was loading 15,000 milligrams per liter of COD at about 200,000 gallons a day. You can see we got aerators pretty tight together here because you've got, that's a massive amount of loading that you're trying to reduce down to a level that mitigates your odor issue. And so you quite a bit of foam. In this instance, the foam was welcome because it doesn't create any other problem. Generally in wastewater, foam is not a problem unless it's a problem. Um, I mean, if it's blowing off and getting an operator in the face, then that's a problem. But uh, in this instance, it's a healthy issue. Here's another one, a little more dramatic. Uh, this picture was taken uh, when this was just a settling pond and the solids build up and build up and a little bit on the site for not staying ahead of that little bit with, um, pulling out of the backhoe or something. Um, but that's a solids build up, creating an island out there. And so they decided to go to the engineers out of Reno and said, let's go with a uh, subsurface aeration. So this pond did get a little bit of air to maintain DO. And they, and they did, when we installed this, they did reach in here and try to get out what they could with a backhoe without tearing this liner. Um, but a year later, we just basically dissolved uh, a lot of that solid in there. I mean, it took quite a bit of time. This wasn't one of those dramatic next day we foamed it off or next month or two months. It, it took a while because we don't have that much air in here. It's, it's a polishing cell, just maintaining DO, but rather dramatic. Get back to HRT, you can use oranges. I mean, if you're in Podunk, Montana, and you, your plant's not performing, you can go down to the grocery store and buy a sack of oranges and go out there and throw them in at the front and watch where they go and time them. 
and you can see what you're, that'll give you a rough approximation outside of doing a dye test or doing a whole bunch of other testing of what your real hydraulic residence time is. Oranges mostly are suspended or underwater. They're not persuaded by the wind. And it's just a poor man's trick to try to establish HRT or give you an idea where your current patterns are. Um, anything from peace time, peace performance. If you go by your neighbor's lagoon and he's got cattails, you are 99% he's got solids buildup going on. And this item, number four, we pound the table quite hard anymore. We find this again and again as some of the best solutions for upgrading your lagoon. I mean, we'll say quarter inch screen. I mean, keep the stuff out. The plastics aren't going to biodegrade in our lifetime. Um, any of the flushable wipes you can potentially keep out. I've got one lagoon in um, Nevada that is on gradient. I'm very happy this has no pump stations to deal with. It's a small little community that's, that services a, a gold mine. And everything gets, I mean, I, I, I swear to goodness, I think I was seeing toilet paper that hadn't even macerated. It just flows downhill, goes right to the, it's all down gradient and he gets everything. And it's a nasty, nasty thing on, on but once it gets to the lagoon, it's a tough thing to deal with. Catfish, um, got a guy in California who's done the catfish, got approved through regulatory. What he wanted to do with the catfish is put him in a downstream pond. He's got like four ponds and it's only a five foot pond and he, he got 50 bullhead catfish approved by regulatory. But the purpose of swimming around and stirring up humic substances is getting up and up for 18 inches so old Sol could help degrade them. And it would help him with his E. coli counts or a colony forming unit, unit counts. Um, here's just a couple slides. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. This is some CFD stuff. We did computational fluid dynamics, the 12 foot assumption, various other things. And what they do is they they slice this aerator at different angles and they'll see what the current patterns are, what the velocity is, and they'll just continue slicing farther and farther away and seeing where it's pulling from. It helps you as a manufacturer, as a designer who's working with Small Town USA on how many of these things do we put in a pond, what, based on the depth, et cetera. It helps you improve your product. And the slide I really like is this one, because it shows CFD that we're pulling solids from an area. I call it the Charles Barkley rebound. Everything in our elbow pattern we're, we're going to get. And what is that elbow pattern? This helps us try to decide, you know, how much, depending on our objective there, you know, how many things, things do we need to put in a pond, what's the air requirement for that, et cetera, et cetera. Pulls right up through that hollow bottom, that static chamber. And that leads us to design uh, a new aerator that'll be on the shelf in, uh, or going to the field in 2020. It's improved in many, many ways, but I'm not going to get all into that right now. Or, but it's something we just learn along the way. You, know, you, can't, you can't innovate and learn, and you're where you're coming to work for. Here's a case study in Revelstoke, Canada. Here is a shot of the aerated lagoon. There's some aeration in the second lagoon. The problem statement was odors. It turns out when we got involved and got under the hood of this thing, they had subsurface EPDM membrane. Uh, diffusers, but they were so old they'd lost elasticity. And it's very important that the EPDM membranes snap off a, a fine bubble, that eight, one eighth to quarter inch bubble, that's a perfectly round bubble. If you had a high speed camera, you could watch these. It's just like a fish's mouth. We'd be going rapidly open and closing, and it's just creating a whole bubble. When the elasticity is gone, you are basically creating these striated bubbles like somebody at the fair making these great big two and three foot tall bub bubbles or a, with a wand out in the backyard, the kids playing. Um, and that's not efficient. That's back that 12 inch bubble was limited surface area. It just gets to the top pretty rapidly and just not efficient. It completely lost treatment. Also, this was a interesting case study of where it was an election year and um, Facebook blew up that everybody's driving a new truck for the city, but nobody cares about the stank and nobody here really has air conditioning at this height and location. Revelstoke also has a very well-known uh, ski mountain that real, real ski buffs got to put that in their bucket list to, to ski it. And they 
basically let evening cool air come in the house. So there's no real air conditioning there. But here's this subsurface diffused aeration. And these membranes have just gotten so old that there was no good methodology on how to change these out over time. But we'll tell you today, you know, you need to look at that five to seven year window to be really in front of the game. And some of the people stretch it to 10 and more, but beyond 10 today, the EPDM manufacturers are getting better all the time too. They're putting some more uh, recalcitrant resistant materials in, in their uh, rubber mixes and they're, they're optimizing them for pulp and paper and dairy and biocides for municipal. So they're getting better too. But there's just a pile. They just drug all this stuff out. They would chop saw it off and keep and just drug it all out. And, uh, and I'm sure this stuff worked really good the day it went in. But you got to have a good maintenance plan down the road. Here's just another quick case study um, in Coopersville, Michigan, which is a million of this is uh, dairy, and only 400,000 is is muni. And so this loads at 2,500 milligrams per liter, and then and it's 30 out the back door. And this is interesting because this is in a sixth year of operation. And these guys have a clarifier in the middle. And interestingly enough, they their water irrigates corn, which feeds the cows, they milk the cows, the milk goes to the processor, they do the cheese, the weight, et cetera, uh, products, whey products, et cetera. And then the wastewater goes back here. And these aerated lagoons here, they actually dose very chloride in bulk solution up front. Again, iron chemistry is odor mitigant. They dose it again uh, inside their uh, clarifier and actually dose it again at some tertiary. Part of the time this year, they actually do discharge to waterway. Um, so it's kind of a chemically enhanced primary treatment, a sept system hybrid, if you will. But uh, they put the points aeration up front and um, it, it's a very successful uh, location. Um, big iron headers above ground. Here is another uh, quick case study um, in Corvallis, Montana. The problem is their diode migrated to zero at their outfall, and they had a primary area lagoon, secondary area lagoon, and the polishing cell. And the polishing cell is the one that fell to zero going into constructed wetlands. This picture is just something they provided us. They, they have the same sort of aeration, it looks like they have up in uh, Revelstoke, Canada. And there's no way to get to it. So they actually drain this their primary area of the lagoon once a year. They get in here and they muck it out and clean it out. And that's the only way they can get down to this uh, to clean it versus going over and picking it back up with a raft uh, that I think we figured out. Um, well, I asked the engineer, I said, how much solids do you think is in your polishing cell? And he, he thought there might be about a foot. They didn't even have a sludge judge there. So I bought one for the operator and we, we went out on a boat and and um, did about 24 grids out here and got a pretty good representation. So that's about 48 inches. So their DO falling to zero, we know that solids consumes um, DO, solar DO is tying up in the solids. He was getting high nutrient reading spikes in his downstream monitoring well from his constructed wetlands, which we believe is some benthol feedback. A pile of solids like this will burp for no reason. And uh, it's just releasing nutrients and phenomena called benthol feedback, so it's referred to. So 11 foot depth, 40 inch of sludge. And then after putting this aeration in, uh, only about 40 days later, we've knocked all that sludge, just shoot through all this duff and got it down to about 14 inches. His DO shoots back up to five, uh, which he didn't need that much DO. So then they put their blower on a timer uh, four hours on, four hours off, and they got it right where they wanted. This was a Home Depot shed. This is a typical small town USA. This is about a $40,000 project just to put a number on it. There's a blower without the uh, uh, weather and sound panel. I said, let's put our own on it. But we found out when they closed these doors, it would eventually over, overheat and over amp because uh, this is all the vents that came in from the factory. So they cut some additional vents over here. And, and this is it, small town USA, they built their own raft. These guys had a blast building this raft. They take this aerator out, they stake the lagoon out here and they pull that aerator out. They put it right down that four inch, four foot of duff on 11 foot lagoon and um, solved their issue in, in pretty short order. Home Depot sheds, short, head, uh, short header, uh, distribution manifold hoses and 
There's a battery right here. It'll then coat a motor. They borrowed this crane off of the local city truck. Here's another one in Oregon, same thing. They had coarse level diffusers in their uh, primary area of the lagoon, and uh, they'd lost the DL down to 0, 0.0. And you've got a 15-acre pond here. It's like turning the Titanic or a battleship. You you don't want to get your DO down low to this because it takes a long time to get that back up. Um, so they, the city had the budget to put in half of the uh, subsurface diffused aeration, immediately spike these due up to 1.8 and then sell at 1.2. And it looks like in 2020, they're going to add the other half uh, to this now. They had the, they had the cash in house. So again, problem state was zero DO, got up to 1.2. That was good enough for them. And that was put in in 2015, so it's been like that for a few years. And just another little small job here. Um, Gallup, New Mexico. Guy had, uh, he was his own operator. This is uh, Navajo country. He had about 170 Navajo that worked for him. He, he basically owned his own small little city, you know, like every single business, a restaurant, used car dealer, convenience store, tax preparation, Western store, all kinds of stuff. And he was his own operator. And he just put in these facultative ponds. And uh, we we looked at it and said, you just need a good layer on that. He only got them three and a half foot deep, couldn't get them any deeper. Um, so we put just some little fine bubble in this pond, got his color back, removed his odor. And this was kind of an interesting job because uh, he said, well, I don't have a boat to get those out there. And I said, well, build a raft. And so we built this raft out of, um, uh, swimming pool noodles and a blow up thing and one of the Navajo guys parked his truck over here another one over here and he got out and he drove the front of the boat and he would belay across on this rope and I rode in the back and then wrestled the aerator off at, at the demarcation points and it was just a cool job so he was happy to be out of woods out of the woods for under twenty thousand dollars there and then here's another interesting one some of these are just small town USA rehabs here's a faculty of the lagoon gone bad um, their duckweed, algae, filamentous solids build up out in the middle, you can see here. And so this is a conversion from facultative to uh, aerobic. And this is a three horsepower blower, two little fine bubble aerators. And this was just after we started up, but a month later, it's bada boom, bada bing. And, and uh, now they're an aerator lagoon, aerator evaporative. It doesn't go anywhere either, but it doesn't smell. And he, all the houses around here are, are lake views. And um, that was a cool little job. And they were having to be out of the woods for about $13,000. Another end of the spectrum, here's Eagle Sewer District uh, in uh, near Boise, Idaho. And this plant, when this it was about 1.9 MGD, right at 2 MGD uh, during the design criteria, here's the old surface aerators. And they have a study going to 2040 of, of looking at 6 MGD from two to one of the fastest growing areas in the United States right now. They go to this lagoon and they go to this lagoon and then it goes to outfall. They've already got drawings to stay with lagoons. And a lot of times you'll say, oh, this is a ready made situation to go to SBR or MBR or some ox ditch or some mechanical plant. But Starting from scratch and professionally managing these lagoons, you can get very good effluent out of it. Stay in front of it. Don't let the solids build up. Don't lose your HRT. And so that's the way uh, the engineers has taken them. So this is what it looks like today. They converted all this to it's a big header in the background, um, floating um, laterals, um, stubs going to the uh, or stubs for future expansion. These buoys indicate there's a, a aerator sitting on the bottom of the pond there. And so we had to design for future growth, significant future growth. That's another angle of the header comes underground from the header building. Big Sulzer turbo blowers. These are very impressive VFDs built in. You stand right in front of them and speak. All this air is pipe, pipe from the clean room. So you know, these exotic multi-hundred thousand dollar deals that are fun, but uh, so are the little McClure boat clubs and the you know, Gallup, New Mexico, with all the Navajos out there helping you install a, a little system. It's just solving problems. Here's what Eva looks like now from the drone footage. So um, we're getting towards the end of the time here. If anybody's got any questions, you might want to start um, putting them down. Um, 
Triplin's got a Lagoons, Lagoons Do It Better community. We get you on an email list and we send out an email blog every two weeks on a different issue. One just came out today is about cold weather operation, what happens to bugs and further 10 degree of temperature drop, how, what's the efficacy of that, and, and just anything that's Lagoons um, we will talk about. We'll actually send you a free hat if you sign up there. But we're Lagoon folk, Lagoons do it better. And that, that brings me uh, to the end here. If there was a slide or a chart or something here you're interested in, write down this email, send me an email, tell me what you're looking for. And um, I can uh, see if I can accommodate that. Now I'll go ahead and go to uh, any questions that uh, anybody might have. I will say that I looked at some of the attendee list prior to this and it was about 70%, uh, 60 to 70% engineers, uh, public works folks, regulatory and uh, actual field operators. So and again, if anybody has a question, you can type it in the, the window on the right. Here's one question, um, the material for our diffusers, it is EPDM. Now we've actually done some studies. Uh, we did a pilot at a sugar beet facility and a wine facility, and we're doing a part of that pilot at a municipal facility, testing different materials. We tested polyurethane, uh, silicone, and multiple of these EPDM mixes that the manufacturers are coming out with. And we determined live in situ, which was the best uh, best material to use for these, these different pilots. And we're able to determine that. We actually designed a rotometer uh, situation where we can see any head loss above ground. We're watching the aerator that's 11 feet on the bottom of the pond. And we could see it from, from above. Of, um, in fact, I might have. I can throw a slide up real quick about that. Maybe. There it is. So here's the diffusers we tested at this one location. We did a coarse bubble diffuser on the far right hand side, which is just plastic with holes drilled in it as a control experiment. We didn't have any issue that thinking those were fouling. And we were trying to make them foul. We wanted to find out who the weakest link in the chain was, what material was. And in order to um, monitor that, we set the up this rotometer system here, which is kind of cool, this floating ball. We could set all these at a specific SCFM and then an op and this was a six month pilot. So we wanted to see if this was going to foul over time. Some operator rounds that could come by and monitor what this value was. So if we seen a curve where one was descending or ascending over time, it would tell us about the performance of that diffuser underwater versus the other method would be to literally lift it up and observe it and test it. But this, this kept you going in situ without shutting the pilot down. So it could give us some great information with regard to 
what was the best diffuser material for this application? And we were able to determine that. Another question, how do you deal with ammonia? Um, I've got a couple minutes. Let me see if I can find another slide real quick that just shows one slide I can talk through. So this is more or less what we do for those that are still still here. We build an MBBR moving bed bioreactor adjacent to the lagoon. We will pump all the water through the, the bioreactor with the, the floating media in it and nitrify 100% of that water. So we'll convert ammonia to nitrite to nitrate and, and nitrify it. We have put the in lagoon we built those web cages or bio cages i think we called ours and they work very well we found but we did not find that they did the entire water body this way we removed that doubt and um nitrify 100 of the water and we will guarantee results out of this in cold weather too because we insulate this and we can also heat this particular particular structure Flowing media going inside again answering the ammonia question. So here's an interesting one back to the ammonia. This is actually under construction. Uh, it's now completed and operational, but this was the early photos they piloted. Um, the previous slide had that data showed good results, but 600. 30,000 gallons a day is a 14 by 14 by 12 foot sidewall depth. So that's what these tanks look like. There's a man standing down here under construction, rebar being built. Here's build out later what it looks like, the portion that's above the ground. Here is a, this is a, it was a dual train situation. This was in DeSoto, Iowa. Um, we were able to use a boiler heat exchanger to create heat for the those times in the, the those cold months of the year when we need to keep the water at 39.2 f which is the theoretical bottom for nitrification um the soto operating just this last january february we had the polar vortex it was 26 degrees below centigrade and you're still coming out there with incredibly low values because we're controlling it. We don't care outside if it's 10 above, 10 below, 20 below. Uh, we're maintaining that water in there at about 41F. Now here's a picture of the Soto. Um, we did the full aeration there. And then this is that uh, nitrox that we were just looking at, the ammonia reduction uh, module right here. But this is when it was really, really cold. And the drone will fly <laughs> 25 below, we found out. Uh, So that's that's how we get after ammonia. And then we add an additional tank if we're going to denitrification. We'll add another tank that's an anoxic zone, a carbon feed. And uh, we'll see the denite most of the time we're going to land app. And nitrification generally is a surface water. But we have started seeing the first permits now that are including ammonia and total nitrogen or nitrates in a surface water discharge. Heretofore, it's been mostly ammonia going to surface water and then total nitrogen when you're on land. With multiple clients that have monitoring wells, they're looking for 10. That's the kind of the default value of 10 total nitrogen or total inorganic nitrogen. And that's it. Another minute for question. Any other question? We 
do a whole thing on ammonia, but that takes the whole period. I'm just going to put this back on my uh, contact slide, and um, that's going to be it. This will be recorded. You have 24 hours. You get an email with your um, participation certificate. If you need something more elaborate for PDH or CEU, you can reply back to us. Join contact info if you need to contact me directly. And um, that concludes our webinar day. Thank you for attending and watch our uh, blog for the next uh, webinar topic. Thank you.